I would like to call to order the Cabarrus County Board of Commissioners work session for January 3rd, 2022. Uh, welcome everyone and Happy New Year. We have, it's hard to get used to adding that two on the end of the date. Uh, first up is the approval of our work session agenda. You all have a copy of that before you. Uh, so at this time, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Uh, I will mention that um, Commissioner Shu is uh, a little under the weather today, so he's unable to be with us. Uh, he may be listening uh, virtually, uh, just depending on how well he felt this afternoon, but uh, our thoughts are certainly with him. And so we move now to discussion items. Uh, and first up is our innovation and technology report. And we're happy to have Todd Shanley to bring that to us. Welcome. Uh, happy New Year. So this year, this, uh, this year I'd like to start with an innovation report that really highlights the, uh, the work that our, our team has done uh, unplanned. So we had a very interesting December, and uh, you'll hear a little bit more about that here in a second. So because uh, the month was so uh, eventful, we're going to go ahead and continue to read the gift of time uh, for this month and spend a little bit more time on that delegation piece. So we're going to keep with the same book for the book club. Uh, to jump right in, uh, this, initi this innovation that we had this month, it clearly falls under the Transparent Accountable Government. And the team created, definitely came up with a creative technology solution to support county services. So to tell you a little bit about what happened, um, we use Kronos UKG timesheet solutions. So many of you probably have friends or other coworkers or things that you do in your daily life who were equally affected by this. I know Atrium had, uh, has, uses this application and uh, Went to a lot of Christmas parties over the last couple of months, and I'm sorry, I can try to reach that. Let me see if I can get it. There we go. Um, and they were experiencing, you know, the same same thing we were on a, on a larger scale. They were hit with a ransomware attack that took out our entire timesheet and attend time and time and attendance solution. So a little background on Kronos and why we use it. Uh, they're a, they're a global leader in uh, workforce management solutions, meaning for us, for time and attendance. The, uh, in 2017, we selected that company to replace our custom solution that we had in-house to be able to implement things like time clocks and a mobile app. And at that time, we decided rather than host it on-prem, on-premise, we pushed push that to the cloud. So that was a decision that we made, you know, at that time and felt like that was a solid Solid solution, you know, to choose, and we're not backing off of that at this point. But it's just chose, rose to have some challenges for us for the last last month or so. So this is the uh, incident summary coming directly from Kronos or UKG now, as they've they've come to rebrand themselves. But they basically, ha you know, on December 11th, which was a Saturday night, identified that they had a ransomware attack. You know, the first notes came out late Saturday night, saying, "Hey, we're having some issues." Sunday morning, we start seeing some things. So we notify our EMS staff and our sheriff staff that, you know, you're going to have some issues with time. We'll, we'll figure it out and we'll get back to you. By Monday morning, we realize that this is a larger issue and we're going to be down for some time. So by Monday, about 10 a.m., we were able to pull together a team to pull, you know, pull together our, our payroll, our HR, and our, uh, our uh, IT staff to kind of assess where are we, you know, what are we going to do? I was the uh, bearer of the bad news to let everyone know that I had talked to some folks and it was going to be an extended outage. Now, did we realize at that point that we were going to be in week five where we are today um, of an outage? But you know, at that time, we knew that time sheets were doing four days. What are we going to do uh, with really with quick decision-making skills, uh, that team came up with an idea that we were going to innovate and we're going to use Excel and create these documents that we needed to do 
to create timesheets and be able to push that out to supervisors and to be able to collect the data quickly and bring it back, you know, and, and be able to upload it into Munis into the payroll. Now, this seems fairly simple. Like, okay, well, how hard is it to tell people, hey, we worked 40 hours this week, we worked 24, and we took 16 for vacation? You know, it, all of that seems very simple, but with 1,400 plus employees, there's varying pay rules over time. There's a lot of complicated things that go on there. And I'm gonna just gonna say, start right now and, and thank Jenny Fox probably about 10 times during this presentation because she has done a yeoman's work of making sure that people were getting paid. And I think that was the important part. It was Christmas time. I mean, look at December, December 13th is, is you know, uh, the worst time to start having people wondering, am I gonna get paid in time to be able to buy Christmas gifts and, and having all of that going on. So the team really stepped up and was able to, to achieve that. Here's an example of what they were able to come up with in a, just a short amount of time to be able to send that out to the supervisors and to be able to, to kind of work through that process. Again, you know, Lundy Covington, Ashley Dobbins, and, and Joyce Cook really worked the, the front end of the <coughs> employee side of things. So if there was an issue with an accrual, they, they were able to kind of hit that on the front end and work that with the employees and the supervisors. Now these are the, the nine people that I am calling out today to thank. Obviously every supervisor and every employee had a hand in this in Cabarrus County because they had to, to step up and do something a little bit differently. But I think it's that uh, culture and innovation that we've cultivated here that will allowed us to be able to pivot so quickly to be able to, to make sure this was a success. So I think that's, that's the high, thing I wanted to really highlight. And again, Jenny Fox and her team of me and uh, Maginot and Tina uh, Solomon really had the hardest work of making sure that the items got, were correct. Going back through every one of those timesheets and making sure that they were correct and we weren't overpaying someone. So that's the other, the other thing we have to really worry about is if you put in too many hours, we overpay someone and that's a detriment to the county. So they really had their eyes on that. And the, the list of, I was on that team back in 2017 that we went through that conversion process and trying to create all of those rules and document all of them. Yeah, the list is very long. So that the ability of, of that team to be able to do that without a computer, because that's why we have computers, right? Is that to be able to do those hard math skills. And these three ladies had to really step up and do that. And then Matt Saunders and Michelle Willie and Jay Johnson on my team uh, really had to, to kind of take that next step and convert the data <coughs> to make sure that we could get it into Munis. And uh, Michelle spent countless hours creating those uh, spreadsheets for each department to make sure they were customized for, so when they did go out. And then Jay's really kind of the superhero on the back end who uh, runs our SQL databases to make sure that they were, they were clean and, and data could actually be utilized. So again, I think that's, that's the short version of that story. Um, we could go on hours and hours of, of why it happened or what, what are we gonna do differently next time. Um, hopefully there's not a next time. I think that's really the, our hope going forward. Um, just wanted to, to, to offer it up for any questions or feedback, but the, there's obviously, December is a, a really hard month for cybersecurity. We always you know, talk about it in October because that's National Cybersecurity Month. But um, in December, that is the time where I think that they, most of those hackers think that we're taking our off the ball because we're trying to, you know, in America, we're trying to celebrate the holidays and a lot of things are going on. And there was the Log4J's uh, vulnerability that was very huge and you may have read about in the news. And then there's some others that are hitting uh, some of the state agencies right now that we're, we're trying to make sure that we're keeping all of that data safe. So um, this is just my call out to say, you know, be careful what you click on and, you know, and if you see something, say something. I think that's, that's our biggest help is if you can put in a help desk ticket and let someone know or, or, or reach out to someone if you see something that looks a little odd, that's, that's the best thing you can do to help you and, and your agency. I guess the question that I would have would be of the other three elected officials in the room. Did any of y'all know anything about this issue that they were dealing with? No. I didn't hear a word. So I would say that means you must have done a very, you and your team did an excellent job of, of taking care of it. They did an excellent job in, in it was my understanding we had it under control. We did. If it would have risen to, if it had gotten out of hand, then we would definitely notify you. But we thought that 
Oh, was, I was saying that was, was a real positive Business thing. as <laughs> usual. Yeah. It, it was just another issue that's business as usual that these guys take care of and yeah. then also our, all of our other department heads. So, Absolutely, uh, yeah. My, yeah. My purpose in bringing it to you tonight was to, to really to highlight those nine people who, who really spent a lot of extra hours. They had to spend a lot of overtime where, you know, several of those folks have young children and would have much preferred spending time doing their Christmas shopping right, right at that time frame rather than working on this Absolutely. this project that really should have been avoided if if our partners with Kronos would have had their eye on the ball. Okay. Well, thank you. It's a multiple, I mean, uh, Worldwide. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So just to clarify for the viewing audience, it wasn't just Cabarrus County. No, uh, it's it was every Kronos workforce uh, platform. So they had a, uh, I'll, I'll go, so I don't get misquoted. They had a workforce central, their telestaff, healthcare extensions, and banking schedule solutions were the uh, areas that were specific uh, issues. So it, they were hosted in their private cloud. So where are, where are they now? We were still down. So we were still working off of our, our timesheets. We did get an update late last night that said that we will be reached out to this week to start restoration processes. So that is good news for Jenny and Matt and and the team to make sure that we are moving towards. Um, and then we're gonna have some additional discussions in the new year to, to see if this is Kronos and UKG are the right partners for us going right. forward. Right. Any other questions for Todd? Thank you and thank, please extend our thanks to, to those nine individuals and, and others that you mentioned. Okay, we move now to item 3.2 from Infrastructure and Asset Management, Courthouse Expansion Project Update, and Kyle Billifer will lead us on that item. Uh, thank you. Before getting into the actual update of the courthouse construction, I did want to give an update on the public art component of the courthouse. Uh, so. I don't have to have two separate agenda items. I'll just kind of update you on both. Um, we have received oh, 77 submissions from um, artists uh, all over the nation, in fact, um, and we are paring those down probably based on uh, my initial review of all 77. It'll probably be down to 30 or 35, and we already have a meeting set up with our internal um, public art committee, who's made up of, I think, eight different folks, um, ranging from the design team to um, local constituents, local artists, uh, things like that. We'll be meeting with them to go over those final selections in both um, the Commissioner Kiger and Commissioner Shu are on that. So I'm sure they're looking forward to that three hour meeting to go through all of those. Um, but uh, so once we get through those, uh, we'll pare down the finalists, um, receive proposals from them and then bring that in front of the board. In terms of the construction of the building, I'm sure that you've been able to, to look across the street and um, see what's going on. I'll go through a couple milestones for the past 30 days and then what's coming up in the next 30 days and then I'll scroll through the pictures and kind of highlight a few things. Um, so in the last 30 days, we've set the uh, last air handler. We've completed the air barrier and facade clips and I've got some pictures of those. Completed the roof installation, uh, started the elevator installations and installed all the switch gear and transformers. So that's all the electrical, large electrical components that are predominantly in the basement. Um, in the next 30 days, we will start to um, finish up the interior pre-dry work. Um, so all the work that can be done inside prior to kind of buttoning up the building, if you will. Um, they'll start some of the interior finishes, start up the new equipment for temporary heat. That's kind of a big thing right now as in terms of the season that we might go into at some point if the weather ever changes, but we kind of need to have um, some of the different um, temperatures in there to be able to do some of the interior finishes that we need to do. Um, and then we'll complete the install of the first two elevators. So um, Angela, if you could scroll down, this shows, this is in fact that first, you just scroll back for one second, I'm sorry. Um, that is the entrance to your, your public lobby. Um, that's off what was Means Avenue, so the public plaza. Um, so the governmental center stands right behind that. And if you were standing right there to my right would be the historic um, courthouse. So you can kind of start to get a general idea of the scale of that public lobby and why suspended public art um, volumetrically is, is going to take up some of that space um, and why that the design team felt there was a need for that. You can scroll down. That shows you some of the facade insulation going up. You can scroll down again. 
shows you your mechanical room, so that is in the basement level, so um, sub-deck off Corbin, uh, and that predominantly right there is all your mechanical equipment, none of that's electrical. You can scroll on. Kind of shows you an aerial, uh, shows you everything being buttoned up, the roof being completed. Could go one more. Shows you, uh, actually, that is all air handler equipment that was already supposed to be installed, but we didn't have some of the actual um, connectors to the roof or the, the ring that goes around the air handler. Oddly enough, the one piece that was on back order was the piece that we needed the most. So we had to, we had to uh, put some of that stuff up on the roof and secure it in place. You can scroll down. Shows you your parking area, subgrade. Scroll down. Shows you more of your exterior facade going up. You can start to see some of the clips going in that lower picture as you scroll down. Those are the actual known as the, the night wall system. Um, and that is what's going to put your Parklex uh, wooden panels, your, your fabricate wooden panels that, that everybody looked at to try to get that warm feeling of the building. That's how those will be adhered to the building. You can scroll down. And that's your elevator shaft, or one of your elevator shafts. Uh, that's actually your public, so that is three elevators. Um, it's only one shaft that I'm showing you, but it's a pretty long way down. You can scroll down. That's you, sitting at the base of your tower crane. It's just tried to show you some of the brick exterior that's going up around there. Um, we've had a, a lot of challenges with some of the elevations and making sure the brick work is done right. And our both our uh, construction manager at risk, Messer, and our design team are doing a lot of quality control on our brick. Um, since it's such a, a predominant piece of this building. You can scroll down. Shows you your new transformers. You can scroll down. Yep, thank you. Any questions? Still, still trending towards the January 2023 open up date for that building. It's looking good. Yes, looks, looks larger every day. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, we move now to item 3.3, solid waste, a Republic Services update. And we're happy to have Kevin Grant with us. And associates. <laughs> yes, good afternoon, everyone, and happy new year. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing to you uh, two employees of Republic Services. Uh, to my far left is Tim Ginn. He is the general manager um, for the Charlotte North business unit, if I was correct with that one. And to my immediate left is Sean Brady, who's the municipal, municipal sales manager for the Mid-Atlantic region. Pretty good I got that one. So and just to let you know, um, Republic Services has the exclusive franchise agreement with Cabarrus County, which involves the curbside collection of trash and recycling for the unincorporated residents for those who wish to subscribe. Um, they also provide disposal for us um, at the CMS landfill, the Charlotte Motor Speedway landfill. Um, so we do get price, preferred pricing with that and airspace, which is very valuable as we'll discuss here shortly. Um, they also provide for us um, trash collection at all the county buildings. So with that, um, you're going to head it off, Tim, Tim's or Tim will go first, and Angela, if you get to that slide. Thanks so much, <clears throat> Kevin, for, for the introduction. Um, good good seeing, seeing everyone here today. Thank you all for having us. Uh, the last time that we were in front uh, of this body, I think it was part of the Cabarrus Summit, and the general manager before myself, Rob Lachrette, gave a brief presentation on the workings of the landfill, kind of landfill trash 101, if you will. Um, and Rob has since moved on. I've, I've been in the seat now for about a year as general manager here at the, uh, at the, the landfill and the hauling company in what we call Charlotte North, and uh, have a really great team that I work with, including, including Sean. Um, Going to take a little bit different approach today on, on our update. Last time was about landfill. Now we'll give an industry update on the solid waste and recycling industry, what we've seen uh, over the past year or so, and how it, how it impacts us locally. Um, so to do that, I will kick it over to Sean. Okay, thank you. So yeah, what Tim said, we do wanna, we're giving our customers across the country just an industry update of what's happened over the past year, especially with COVID. So if we can uh, go to the next slide. 
And I know you guys are slam packed, so I'm going to go through this a little faster than normal. But what's the top? What, what's top of mind over the last year and a half? And these are some things we'll touch on. COVID. How did that affect the waste industry? How did it affect recycling? How did it affect you at home recycling? Uh, the China sword. Some of you may have heard that term. Some of you may have not. But in 2017, China used to take a majority of the recycling from across the U.S. And at one point, they announced they would no longer take material unless it was uh, had 1% or less contamination, which threw the market worldwide into a tailspin. And then in March 18th, they implemented it. So we'll give a little update there. And the things that every business owner affects today is uh, employees, drivers, what challenges do we have in the waste and recycling industry? And I want to finish up on sustainability, which we get a lot of questions on, and most popularly electronic electric trucks we get a lot of questions on. So let's go to the next slide. So what we, we have three areas of uh, business in the waste industry. So we do residential service, which you're all familiar with, we do commercial or what we call your, you know, your businesses, the large square containers. And then we have industrial, which is like roll off containers that do buildings like your construction across the street. So if you look in the upper left hand corner, what we saw when the pandemic hit, that's the residential volume. And you can see once everybody stayed home, a lot of trash started being generated at home. And as you go through the quarters, it has come down, but it has not come back to where it was originally. So we do feel as a company nationwide, there still is a lot of people and probably will be in the future working uh, from home. So that was an interesting statistic. On the commercial side, which is the upper right hand corner, we saw an immediate drop of businesses saying, I don't need any service now. Uh, from everything to rest, you know, a lot of restaurants closed. So that was a, a <coughs> very noticeable drop. It has recently come back to about where it was before. So we're glad to see that. And then on the industrial side, we did see some initial additional drops when everything stopped, but that has really came in gear in our construction dumpsters and so forth. That we're doing better than we were before at that point. Uh, next slide. Uh, so how did the pandemic uh, supply chain, everybody's heard that term. What this graph shows is just the, the cost of steel over the last few years. And just to quickly give you, so, so you can kind of get it in your mind, in 2015 we have two, three, four, six, and eight yard containers. So just a three yard container costs $400 for us to purchase in 2015. 2021 and Q3, that is $737. And also our trucks are basically steel. So you can see that the trucks have also gone up too. But we hope to see that come down, but just wanted to relay that information. The next slide kind of gives you a trend on the recycling markets, the comp commodities. So you can kind of see it starts where I mentioned the China sword where the entire market just tanked. And we are finally coming to a point we, where we are seeing the material values get back to where they were in the past. One interesting thing to note, if you look on the right-hand column, OCC, that is an acronym for cardboard. You can see in 2021, it's 54% of Republic's material was OCC, and we think that's strictly e-commerce and that that's going to continue to rise. The next slide, this just shows, uh, I won't get bogged down in it, but the uh, proper business model, uh, you know, from a collection company like Republic, you know, we're the experts that collect material and then we dispose of it. And this, this is referencing recycling, so we process it. Uh, we own a facility in Greensboro and one in Hickory. We don't own the one in Charlotte. And then on the municipality side or the city side, on the recycling side, there's residuals and usually there's a contamination uh, amount in the recycling material. And once that is determined, 
the end result is when commodity prices are higher, there can be a commodity partnership. But um, ours is a little bit different in this market since it's an open market uh, franchise and not a, the city itself. And then the next slide. We as partners, uh, you know, there are annual price increases and you are what we call the water sewer trash index, which is basically what it was. CPI is a very large index that can has thousands of categories from toys to meat to alcohol to clothing. And we've always asked our customers over the years to reflect the water sewer trash, which is more indicative of the cost of our company. You can see uh, the CPI, which is kind of the generic urban CPI, has really spiked in the past few months. And it's, I think it was almost six and seven percent in August. So we're glad to see that uh, under your current contract, you are under the water trash index. Next slide. Uh, just a quick slide on the labor shortage. Uh, you know, there are fewer drivers out there, but there are more driver jobs that are needed. Fortunately, uh, for our Charlotte North business unit, uh, we are one of the few that we did have enough people throughout the pandemic. Actually, we were overstaffed and on for about a year and a half, we uh, assisted the city of Charlotte. They would call us each morning with three routes. We didn't know where we were going, but we did the three routes. So we're very proud from our Charlotte North business unit that we were overstaffed. But uh, we see it across the country, you know, we're hearing discussions today, you know, so-and-so was out. So, so, you know, trash is not a uh, uh, glamour industry, but when it's not working, you hear about it very quick. Uh, so we are glad that from Charlotte North, we're doing well. But it is an ongoing thing, and, uh, you know, we do offer signing bonuses, referral bonuses. We try to be as creative as we can to make sure that our customers uh, do not feel anything from there. And then lastly, uh, sustainability. We get a lot of questions about that. And I would recommend there's a very in-depth report, republicservices.com slash sustainability. And I won't go over all these just due to time and uh, on all your issues you have today. But I did want to, organics are becoming popular. But like I said, electronic trucks are probably the most questions we get asked. We are in the very early, early stages. Uh, you know, we're a very large company across the country, but ironically, we are doing a test truck in Hickory, North Carolina. Um, and it's amazing, I've heard the truck is so quiet that they want some sort of added piece to it just from a, a safety factor of driving through a neighborhood. So we're, we, we're anxious, we, we, we are doing some stuff out west and we are, going to tell our customer as soon as we know, you know, our CEO has said we will be an electronic fleet company. So we're very excited about that. And with that, uh, the last well, takeaways, we talked about those uh, due to time. We won't go over those, but that's there for your uh, reading. And then lastly, we, we have won a number of awards over the past few years as uh, a very good company to work for. Uh, I won't go over all those, but we get a lot of sustainability awards, uh, employees for women, uh, most admired companies. Uh, so we're very, very excited about that. And with that said, any questions or comments? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope that helped. Okay, we move now to discussion items for action. First up is item 4.1 from finance presentation of fiscal year 2021 annual comprehensive financial report. That was a lot of words. <laughs> Welcome. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to present the 2021 fiscal year annual comprehensive financial report. Um, this document is prepared with great precision and long process with the help of the majority of the finance department. 
And I have several with me here today. So I want to thank especially Deputy Finance Director Suzanne Burgess, who organizes and manages the yearly audit and financial statement preparation. If she'll stand. I'm going to <laughs> and I also have with um, me two of our accounting supervisors, Katrina Myers-Arnold and Brenda Lee. And my other one is Jenny Fox, who we've already spoke to about this afternoon. I'm very thankful for her also. And as we have payroll is due is this Friday, so she's busy with that and couldn't be with us this afternoon. Um, but without all them and the entire department's help, as well as the county manager's office, we would not be able to prepare the financial statements. Um, Management is responsible for preparing and fair presentation of the financial statements in, according with, in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And after the financial statements are prepared by the county, the auditors review them and then they are sent to the local government commission or the LGC. And this year they were sent November 30th. Um, the LGC implemented a new rule this year which requires the financial statements to pre be prepared and accepted uh, by the board within 45 days. So that's why we are asking you to accept these financial statements today instead of, I guess, in two weeks. And um, the county also submits the financial statements for the Government Finance Officers Association Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. In fiscal year 2020, we have again received this award, and that was the 36th consecutive year that the county has received this award, and we've also submitted the financial statements this year for award consideration. Um, next slide, please. So this year, I've given you all 252 pages that um, our staff has put together. There's 17 exhibits, 35 schedules, 17 tables, and a compliance section. And of course, our main operating fund is the general fund. And this year, we added our community investment fund. And, and in some places, that's combined with the general fund. And for, in addition to these funds, we also have 11 capital project funds, nine special revenue funds, two custodial funds, two internal service funds, one enterprise fund, and 61 pages of notes to help explain all those funds. So. <laughs> And at this time, I'd like to turn it over. I'm going to introduce Matt Braswell. He's the senior management manager with accounting firm Martin Starnes and Association, and he led our audit this year. Thank you, Wendy, and uh, thank you, Chairman and members of the board, for allowing me to take some time out of your work session today. We truly do appreciate it. And um, if you'll go to the next slide, um, just wanted to go over and, and tell you um, kind of the audit highlights uh, from the audit for the 2021. Um, this is a snapshot in time. We issued an unmodified opinion on the financial statements. That means that is that is what we consider a clean opinion, which means your financial statements are materially correct in accordance with GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. No financial statement findings, no single audit findings, uh, an unmodified <coughs> opinion on uh, your federal and state awards. Now, this is all the funding, such as the CARES Act funding, your Medicaid funding, various pots of money that come from the federal or state government. Um, I'm, I think we audited probably 10, 11 uh, federal and state programs. That takes a ton of time uh, to do that. And so uh, we want to thank your staff as well on that from everyone from finance, Wendy, we truly appreciate the relationship that we have with Cabarrus County. Wendy, her staff, Suzanne, um, everyone from payroll to DSS to the the health department, everyone that we work with, very, very appreciative of their time, able to get us everything in a timely manner, and it truly uh, helps us out to get your report submitted on time to the LGC. And uh, it has been accepted by the LGC as of December the 20th. And as Wendy was uh, stating, that within submission of your audit to the LGC, there is a new standard that we have to, the auditors have to present to you any findings, any issues, anything that we come up with in the audit within 45 days of that submission. So that is why we are, we are doing this a little sooner um, this year here. But uh, truly appreciate the, the, um, uh, the work that your staff puts in and uh, we we're very thankful but overall very very good year for Cabarrus County no findings nothing to relay and Wendy will go into a few of the highlights uh, within the year such as uh, very increases in uh, various revenues uh, very various summaries there but overall um, uh, very good year and a clean report to to relay to the board for Cabarrus County next slide please so I won't bore you with all 252 pages, but I'll just briefly go over the general fund, our main operating fund. 
So for the budget, we had 313 million in total just for the general fund, and the revenues came came in over budget 12.3 million, and expenditures were under budget 14.2 million. In the general fund, transferred 46.6 million to the community investment fund, and this is mainly for debt, because debt is paid out of the community investment fund this year. But we still had an increase in general fund fund balance of 6.3 million. Property tax and sales tax, of course, are our two largest revenues, and they both saw an increase during um, fiscal year 21. Our budget was 210 million for property tax, and we actually received 214 million, which put us 4 million over budget. Um, and a reason for this is uh, increase in the collection percentage, increased from 98.7% to 99.1%, and that's due to a great job by the tax collection department. And in fiscal year, 2021 was also a revaluation year. And you'll see on this next slide, the increase that we saw in property taxes was large from 20 to 21, and that was due to their revaluation year. And we saw a 20% increase in revenues from 20 to 21 for property taxes. And our other large um, revenue source is sales tax. Um, for the 2021 budget, we budgeted 48.8 million, and that is the general, in the general fund and community investment fund, because we budget sales tax in both of those funds. And total collections ended at 62.5 million, um, which put us 13.7 million over budget. So as I said before, we budgeted uh, when COVID was just beginning, so we were budgeted a 30% decrease, but we saw an 18% increase from fiscal year 20 to 21 for sales tax, so it was 52.9 million, and this year we were at uh, 62.5 million collections. Next slide. An expenditure summary, we were 6% or 14.2 million under budget for expenditures. Um, some of the large uh, chunks of this was salary and benefits, um, just 2% under budget, which isn't a lot, but that equaled $2 million almost. And human services grants, we didn't spend about 2.2 million. Um, unspent economic incentive grants of 1.8 million, which that'll be paid in later years, and 1 million in motor vehicle purchases, and this, these were also reappropriated in fiscal year 22, 2022, and then another million and a half in purchase services were unspent. And I'll be happy to answer any questions, and again, I'd like to thank Suzanne, Katrina, Jenny, and Brenda Lee and the entire staff and the county manager's office for all their help in this year's financial statements. And I'll be able to, happy to answer any questions now or any time. I don't really have any questions. I would just say there's a lot of impressive numbers in there, but I would have to say that a 99.1% uh, tax rate collection is pretty <clears throat> phenomenal. So thanks to the citizens as well as our tax department. So that's a good job. certainly echo that and you know I, th I think a lot of the assumptions that many of us would have made in this COVID year were incorrect uh, you know we would have I would have expected sales taxes to to go down collection rate to to be less uh, so to buck all those assumptions is certainly good news and we appreciate you handling that for us and bringing that to us and dealing with the auditors and getting such, right. <laughs> such yes. great results. Yes. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> just, to, just to touch on the sales tax there, we are, we are still seeing a, a fairly large uptick in sales tax for the first six months um, uh, of the year. So sales tax, um, from what I've seen and the clients that I have talked to, that sales tax is not going, it's not decreasing like we are, it's, it's still staying up at the, at the very high 10 to 15% range. I mean, it's, it's trending from a lot. I don't know necessarily how, how it is at Cabarrus County, but um, we are still seeing a, a very upshift in, in sales tax. It's coming in a lot higher than we're still expecting. Right, great, excellent. Thank you very right. much. And Thank I you. think we do have a request to take action. Oh, yes. <clears throat> on this item tonight. So at this time, I would entertain a motion to suspend the rules of procedure due to time restraints on approving this uh, or accepting this report.
Okay, we have a motion and a second to suspend the rules. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. And I would entertain a motion to accept the fiscal year 2021 annual comprehensive financial report as presented. And the, yes, there's one project little, ordinance. yeah, and you all have a printed copy of the project ordinance. Uh, so to add on to that motion <clears throat> and the uh, project ordinance. The this project, is a, the this is a different, is this one. the yeah. printed one's a different yes, one. That's a different agenda item. Gotcha. So this is just to accept the financial the statements. Yes. So the first original motion was correct. Uh, any discussion on that? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. You, you congratulated our finance department as well, but our tax collector's office worked, and, and as well as our assessors as well, worked very hard over the last year right. and to achieve 99.1 percent in any year is is fantastic but in a year like last year it was well, just certainly over and above. I, I thought i said that but if i didn't shame yeah. on me because yes that didn't happen on its own right so thank right. you for fixing that right. any idea what the state average is i mean that's got to be uh, i don't know that seems like a pretty phenomenal number to me it's it's big yeah uh i'm not sure what the average is i'll find it out for you though i'd be you know, curious to know I mean, it's, it's, that has to be higher than the yeah. state average yeah. Like you said, especially in last year's climate. Yeah, and just remember the, the your budget the next year is based on your tax collection the previous year. So, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> we move now to item 4.2 from Salisbury Rowan Community Action Agency. Presentation of the fiscal year 2022-23 application for funding. Uh, and we are happy to have Sherry Tillman with us. For that presentation i think she's virtual yes welcome and we do not have audio for you i'm not sure if that's i don't see the little mute symbol on the screen but we can't hear you she may not be able to hear you either. so uh, you may not be able to hear me i can hear you fine can you yeah. hear me everything's good here. okay now we can hear you Okay, um, good afternoon, um, Chairman and members. Thank you for allowing me to call in. I've been ill over the holiday, so um, thank you for allowing me to call in. So I'm going to try and share my screen with you. I sent um, a copy of the presentation to Lauren, um, just in case you know I have a faux pas um, on my end. So, um, are you guys able to see my screen at this time? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so, like I said, my name is Sherry Tillman. I'm the Family Services Director um, for our agency at Salisbury Rowan Community Action Agency. We service Cabarrus as well as Rowan counties. Um, I'm not going to be before you long, just going to give you a little bit of information about our funding application. And um, at the end, I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. All right, so just to give you a little information about um, the Community Services Block Grant and a little bit about our history. Uh, in 1964, Congress passed the Economic Opportunity Act, which established the funding for community action agencies and programs. Um, we have more than a thousand agencies um, for the community action agencies, that is, um, where we coordinate and deliver programs and services to low income Americans. Um, and that's about 99% of our, um, the nation's counties. Um, community representation and accountability are hallmarked for our CSBG network. Um, right here, our agencies are governed by a tripartite board. The board structure consists of elected public officials, uh, representatives from our low-income community, as well as appointed leaders um, from the private sector. Because of the CSBG funds um, and the central management and core activities of these agencies, the CSBG network is able to mobilize additional resources to combat the central causes of poverty. All right, so... Um, our total funding allocation amount is $586,275. Um, 
and we determine that allocation, we use the um, the Census Bureau um, small area income poverty estimate to determine where that allocation is going to go in terms of our service area. Um, and for Rowan County, then Parrish County is 23,330. Um, and for Cabarrus County, it's 21,233,000. Um, All right, so this is just a breakdown of how we, um, our plan to allocate that funding in those, in those service areas based on that um, poverty count. Um, so for Rowan, you see Rowan, we have um, the poverty count is a larger count there. So the um, they would, um, at, we would allocate more funding to that area and then the other part of that portion of that funding to Cabarrus County. All right, so this is just a little bit of information about our self-sufficiency program. Um, like I said, we're funded by the Community Services Block Grant. It's designed to assist uh, income eligible individuals and families in the rural and Ferris County who are motivated to obtain employment for better employment with the goal of becoming self-sufficient. So some of the supportive services that um, we provide um, are employment assistance, job training, uh, entrepreneurship support, budget as well as financial literacy, professional development, as well as case management services. All right, so these are our projected um, outcome targets for the 21-23 um, year. So um, our plan is to serve 100 participants of the eight, I mean, of the community. Um, we plan to um, um, assist 10 um, low-income families rise above poverty. Um, um, 15 participant families obtaining a, employment, uh, five uh, participant families obtaining better employment with five of, obtaining jobs with medical benefits, as well as um, 20 families completing educational training programs. Um, two of those secure and standard housing, um, providing emergency assistance to 20 families, and 30 um, providing employment supports and um, education supports. So those are our projected um, outcomes for the, um, the next calendar. And this is just um, a little snapshot of our um, community impact for the 2021 year. These are just the some of the goals that we, um, our targets for last year for emergency assistance. We, can, we provided 32 um, assistance to 32 families, um, employment gains five, Education supports 52, um, employment supports 43, uh, four housing gains, as well as 21 um, education gains. Um, so this is just a little snapshot of our locations. Our main location, um, we're located in um, Rowan County, um, 1300 West Bank Street in Salisbury. And our Cabarrus location, um, we are located now in the nonprofit center right on U Street, right downtown, um, Concord. Um, we have this, we were located in the um, McGill Avenue location, but we since moved to the um, nonprofit center at the Union Street location. Um, so we've been there since they opened earlier in the year and that's our location there. Um, I'll, I'll welcome any questions that anyone may have at this time. Hi, uh, this is Commissioner Kiger. Thank you very much for that presentation. I, just as a year over year review, the, the numbers that you just showed of gaining employment or um, getting a job with health care benefits, how, did that, how does that compare to last year's numbers? So I'm, I only heard part of that. I could see your mouth moving, but I couldn't <laughs> hear the, the question. Well, there's probably a lot of people when they see my mouth moving that wish they couldn't hear me. So um, how do the numbers compare from last year to this year? The, the, the chart where you said 130 families you've served and then you had some data underneath that. Is it about yes. the same or is it increased? So we had some areas, some of our areas have increased and um, in terms of the number of participants that we are um, planning to serve, that remains the same. But some of our education supports, they um, they have changed. Um, we've increased those. 
we've had, um, we didn't quite meet all of our targets last year and we contribute a lot of that to um, our office was closed for part of the year because of COVID-19 and just um, just trying to get some of our participants to work and, and just to be a part of our, not be a part of our program, but just take advantage of our services. Our numbers were a little down last year. So we're wanting to look and see where the company is going. So we adjusted um, many of them to increase the amount of services that we are planning to provide this year. We're we're already beginning to see an uptick on um, some of the services that we provided last year. We've seen those things improve, so we increase our target. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Hey there, just a quick question. Has the need in increased as a result of COVID? I know we're, what is it, 21,000 for Rowan and about 20,000 for Cabarrus? Yes, yes, we think so. Okay, any additional questions for Ms. Tillman? Okay, well, we thank you very much for being with us today to make that presentation. Well, thank you so much for having me. Okay, and so this will go on our consent agenda for a motion to acknowledge receipt of this report. Uh, so next up is item 4.3, appointments to boards and committees, and you've all received copies of those. Uh, they're pretty self-explanatory. If anybody has any questions or comments, if not, we will move on to item 4.4 from Cooperative Extension, Cabarrus County Youth Commission bylaw update, and we are delighted to have Tracy LeCompte with us to discuss that item. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, the Cabarrus County Youth Commission um, is doing a great job this year. They will be meeting here in about a half hour to um, be looking at our spring um, events and updates. They have um, gone through the process to amend their bylaws. As you know, we have a new high school here in Cabarrus County, West Cabarrus, and they would like to amend the bylaw to include um, two students, uh, two positions on the Youth Commission um, that would come from West Cabarrus High School. Uh, so that is the bylaw update there. And you'll see that um, in your documents. Um, there's two spots to update it. Um, where in the membership clause, it'll include two students from West Cabarrus High School with a total then of 22 youth uh, total for the Youth Commission. Okay, any questions for Tracy? We're happy to see it growing for sure. And I think you have the next item also, Cabarrus County uh, Family and Consumer Science Program Line Budget Increase. I do, yes. So as you know, um, NC Cooperative Extension serves in three program areas. Uh, we serve in Family Consumer Sciences, 4-H Youth Development, and then within Agriculture. Here in Cabarrus County, um, Agriculture, uh, we serve in three different areas, Horticulture, Livestock, and Field Crops. Um, and each one of these have their own um, budget um, um, line item for program items. And that is a, um, a zero cost to the county. So those program areas, well, for the family consumer science area, that is a uh, income and expense account that um, whatever they bring in, they spend. Um, and so we have had the fortunate um, experience that we have already exceeded our um, income account for our Family Consumer Science Agent Program, and we are um, asking for that budget to be um, increased from $500 to $1,000 for that line item. So that is written out in your um, paperwork as well. If you have any questions, I'm happy to do so. Uh, Ms. Chairman, I, did you said 500 to 1,000 because the, the Summary sheet says 2,000. I'm sorry, yes, 2,000. 2,000. Yes. Gotcha. Okay, any other questions for Tracy? All right, thank you very much. Thank you very kindly. Okay, we move now to item 4.6 from Emergency Management, Homeland Security Grant Award and Budget Amendment. We're happy to have Steve Langer with us to talk about that item. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, Cabarrus County has been awarded uh, a North Carolina Emergency Management Homeland Security Grant. 
this is a regional grant in which uh, local jurisdictions rotate as a host uh, for the grant. Uh, and this cycle, Cabarrus County is looking to uh, host. Uh, the grant is for sheltering equipment to be distributed uh, to counties in our region. Uh, as the host county, Cabarrus will also receive some of that uh, sheltering equipment. This is 100% uh, funded. There is no cost match. Uh, we will file a closeout report in the end and receive reimbursement from North Carolina Emergency Management. So we're asking for a motion to accept the award and uh, a budget amendment in the amount of $20,000. Okay, questions for Steve. Give me an example of what equipment. sheltering equipment is. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna let Mr. Burnett sure. actually cover. Okay. Mr. Burnett is gonna actually be uh, the one managing this grant and the project for us. Sure, so sheltering equipment will consist of cots, blankets, and pillows. So we'll purchase those and then we'll distribute those uh, to each county within the, the region there. Right, and so we have a stockpile of those at various locations around the county in the event of an uh, emergency we do event. we we have some here at the county level our american red cross community partner also has some of those as well um, and this is actually a continuation grant from a couple years ago there was another county that hosted a previous grant that was able to distribute x amount of uh, items out and this is kind of a continuation of that to try to fill uh, some remaining needs within the right. region yeah. with this grant funding they do um, vulnerability uh, and threat assessment and so we have to meet some of those requirements and that was one of the gaps that was identified was sheltering and sheltering equipment for the region right excellent thank you all right thank you thank you any other questions okay um and i felt sure that that question that came up earlier about the uh, tax collection rate i started to say david's thrift is probably watching this program and will uh, report in and that was true and so the state collection rate average is 98.8. Uh, so Cabarrus County is significantly higher than the state average. So thank you, David, for that hard work and thank you for that information as well. Okay, we move now to item 4.7 uh, from finance and that would be an adjust the soil and water prime farmland funding to capital improvement plan level and we're glad to have Wendy Hegler back with us for that item. So per the um, capital improvement plan, the soil and water prime farm little funding level should be $125,000. That's $100,000 budget for future easements and $25,000 for legal fees to um, increase this back to those levels. We need a budget amendment of $7,265. and. We're requesting that you approve the budget amendment and related project ordinance. Okay, any questions for Wendy on that item? Okay, thank you. We move then to item 4.8, Cabarrus County School Board request. So Cabarrus County School Board has is requesting to um, budget sales tax savings to cover um, at overage for Roberta Road Middle School Technology. I have with me Brian Cohn from the school system to answer any questions that you may have. We are asking that you approve this motion tonight to um, allow them to go ahead with uh, approval of their contract. So we, need, we would need approval of the budget amendment and associated project ordinance. Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just give you a quick overview of why I'm here. So in November of last year, we received um, bids from nine different firms for the technology switches for Roberta Road Middle School. Obviously, the budget for those switches was set pre-COVID. Uh, they have come in over budget, and we are asking for the transfer of sales, available sales tax funds from the construction account into technology infrastructure to cover, cover the shortfall. If it gets any more technical than that, I have our CTO with me that can answer <laughs> questions for you. Well, I would, I would hate for them to spend the time to come here and not answer some question. <laughs> you know. Well, come up with a good one, Mr. I'm Morris. just not smart <laughs> enough to think of that question. <laughs> Do any of you have questions for, for Brian? And just, just to elaborate just a little bit more on how that works, 
sales taxes that are expended on these projects are refunded back to the county, the county. The county. Yes. not to the school yes. system because of the they're not eligible the way because the, they're a state right mm -hmm. the laws are so that that's where this comes comes from yes sir okay I think we're good okay. and we Thank do you. have a request to take action uh, yes. on this tonight so I would entertain a motion to suspend the rules of procedure in order to vote on this tonight we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. And I would at this time entertain a motion to approve the transfer request and to approve the associated budget amendment and project ordinance uh, for the transfer of sales tax savings to cover uh, technology overages. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and we move to item 4.9, Wendy again, Emergency Rental Assistance Grant. And this is the project ordinance that you were given earlier. I think it goes with this item, agenda item. So the county received in the emergency rental assistance grant, um, the first allocation we received over six and a half million that the county has spent the majority of these funds. Um, the state also allocated a little over $4.9 million to the county. So um, we're asking that you approve um, the budget amendment to budget the revenues and expenditures. Um, so this grant's not, um, so we can continue funding this grant and it's not held up. So there's attached budget amendment to recognize those revenues and expenditures and there's also the project ordinance. Okay, questions receive. on this item. And as she mentioned, you do have the printed copy of that before you. Uh, and this is another one that <clears throat> they are requesting we act on tonight. So I would entertain a motion uh, to suspend the rules of procedure due to time constraints. So moved. Yeah, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. And I would at this time entertain a motion to adopt the budget amendment and the associated project ordinance uh, for the emergency rental assistance grant allocation. Does that sound? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Thank you. And then we we still keep right on going with the I Wendy show. I was going to go away today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, so we move to item 4.10. <laughs> Uh, from Human Resources Health Insurance Funds, Health Insurance Fund, and we're glad to have Lundy Covington join you on that one as well. So the, I'm going to speak about the attached budget amendment, and she's going to answer your questions and talk about the Atrium Health contract that we have. So the attached budget amendment um, budgets additional um, medical claims um, and HRA and wellness waste is associated just with increased claims this year and with the additional employees that um, the county has. Here's Wendy. <laughs> okay. Well, the reason we're bringing you this at this time of year is because of the contract, I believe. Normally we would do this a little bit later in the year once we see how claims are going. So that's the reason they're kind of both presented today. The atrium contract renews on November 1st each year. It's basically a continuation contract, but there were some changes. So because we were bringing that to you, we wanted to also ask for consideration because of the claims experience that we're having. So that's, again, kind of why they're tied together. As far as the contract itself, David Goldberg has reviewed the contract. They have changed the format this year, trying to be a little more consistent with their other external clinics. So I think he has given green light on that, and I believe he's here in the room if we need him to weigh in. Um, as far as the adjustments this year, there were two major reasons for increases. The first was an increase due to staffing. 
Um, one piece of that is we took a part-time medical office assistant and turned it into a, a full-time FTE to provide more assistance in the clinic. That's the key position that is actually initially seeing our employees. They're assisting with um, screenings, including flu and COVID, those types of services. So it was important to have more hours for those services this year. So taking that person from part-time without benefits to full-time with benefits was a driver. There are other um, factors for staffing is that they'll be giving increases to their, their staff that work. So that was another piece of the, the salary line item. The other reason for the increase is due to their administration fee. And that's basically what they're passing on to us for the services they provide to the clinic. So that includes their marketing efforts, um, the clinic manager. They've been pretty helpful in terms of doing COVID related education this year and coming out and assisting with some things of that sort that we can provide virtually to our staff. Um, so those were the two primary reasons for the increase, but we did want to get that in front of you as we're in a point to, I guess, renew that agreement. Um, and then if you have questions about the budget amendment itself, as far as the clinic, we are operating a little higher than we would like. That's to some extent COVID, but something that potentially, I think we could maybe look for some other funding, but we have a few claims that are already ready either at the stop loss point or almost there. So that's what's kind of putting us in, in this situation. We had a pretty hard hit month in October. November came back down and hopefully December will continue to do that as well. But we wanted to try to stay a little bit ahead of that. So any other questions that I can answer? Questions for Wendy or Lundy? did a good job explaining it. Thank you. Okay, and we, this will uh, be on our agenda for our, our regular meeting. We do not have to act on it tonight. And so we move now to item 4.11, Rowan Cabarrus Community College funding transfers and additional requests for a welding lab. And we are, and Wendy will lead us on that. We're, then we'll be joined by Dr. Carol Spaulding and Kelly Klutz <laughs> as well. All right. Um, so Rowan Cabarrus Community College is requesting an additional $411,571 for a welding lab and also approval to transfer funds from completed projects to projects that are over budget. Um, I've attached Dr. Spaulding's letter um, but they are, of course, also here to answer any questions that you may have that we are asking that you would approve the attached budget amendment and project ordinance. I would assume you have demand for a welding lab. You want to expand on that a little bit? Yes, you know, definitely we have a demand for welding lab. As you know, we have one on A.L. Brown. Uh, in the evening, we use that for adults. And at North Campus, we, are, we have a waiting list of up to 100 people who are wanting to be uh, welders. Uh, we don't have this level of uh, vocational program in this county and we want to start moving to more hands-on in Cabarrus County for the future. So yes, we do. There are many, many uh, demands for welding, uh, well, for welders in the community. And so we think it's a really great, uh, great occupation. One that you can go in, get a little bit of skill, get a job, get a bigger skill. So it's, it's, uh, it's really been one of our staples since the college was created. So where will this, will this be an additional welding lab? Yes. And where will it be located? It will go in space that is underutilized at South Campus. Okay. Um, so it needs renovation. And when you're doing welding, you have to put a lot of electricity in there. That's part of the expense of it. Um, but what's happening with all of our hands-on programs is we're doing social distancing. And so you can't build things as tight as we usually have them. So I think all of us, are aware of that and um, I just want to say happy new year to everybody and <laughs> thank you for a very nice presentation um, but that's I think welding has um, it's got a great past but it's also got a better future so yeah we think it's a great investment for Cabarrus County and would be be well utilized well, I have personally visited both of those welding labs and um, and, and, I, and I know the one at North Campus is, is, is very tight, so I'm sure that that creates some challenges. So I, I think this is a very positive thing. And I've heard really positive reports back from folks that have 
participated there at the Kannapolis location as well. So it's yeah. a had, real asset. Yeah, we've had great partnerships with, the, with all of the school systems. And with the uh, early college moving out of the bottom of South Campus, you're going to see more opportunities for us to move programs in there. Right. Okay. okay. Other questions on that item? Thank you very much. Okay, we move now to item 4.12, which Wendy continues on. <laughs> Transfer of funds for 15% fund balance policy. So as you heard in my presentation before, we were able to add to our <coughs> fund balance for fiscal year 2021, and I've attached the calculation um, that we use to transfer the money um, over to when we'll transfer this money over to our cap our community investment fund is um, $15.9 million that we'll be able to transfer this year um, for future project allocation. And I'll be glad to answer any questions on the um, calculation or budget amendment. And this is per our county financial and budget policies. And, and this is the, I think, they referred to it in the past as CAFR amount or no? This is different. Um, I may, um, that the CAFR is our financial statement, so I'm sure they maybe presented it with the financial statements prior to maybe? Probably, so, so this is the, to uh, represents income over expenses that yes. we traditionally make the one transfer every year? Yes. Right. Have the 15 percent? Yes, so it's available fund balance, yes. the 15 percent. Okay. And so, when, when you said money for projects, that's in excess of the 15 percent. Yes, so we're moving with the budget amendment attached, we'll move that 15.9 million over to our CIF fund, and that'll be sitting there for future projects as the board sees fit. And I'm sorry, which fund? The community investment fund. Okay, I thought, yeah. Did I? Well, it says CIF, and I was listening and looking at the same time and wanted to make sure I heard that correctly. Great. So, yes. Any other questions on that item? Okay. We move to item 4.13, uh, Transportation Grant Budget Amendment. The last one. Um, I think Wendy's being okay. joined by yes. Bob Bushy on that one. <laughs> So the Transportation Department received approval from the board to apply for 5310 grants, and these are administered through the City of Concord. The county is a sub-recipient of these funds, and we received awards for 2018, 2019, 2020 years. And this budget amendment revises the 2018 grant funds and also budgets 2019 and 2020. So it's basically a cleanup of these 5310 grant funds. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Bob. Any questions on that item? Anything to add, Bob? Uh, no, uh, the 5310 being a federal grant different from the state is when you don't spend the funds, it carries over. So that's basically what we're going to do. Right. Okay, thank you very much. And we move now. Is the, the gosh, that's your last item, Wendy? <laughs> Sorry, you got more happened. coming later. Okay. <laughs> we move now to item 4.14 from infrastructure and asset management, courthouse expansion manager at risk contract. And Kyle Billifer is back with us. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to read this long spiel. And this spiel is kind of the history of the different GMP contracts. Um, since we're discussing um, bringing in contingency funds from outside the GMP and bringing them into the GMP, which we've done once before. I think it's important to go through the history of, of the contracts with the project since it's so large. Um, currently, Cabarrus County has a guaranteed maximum price-based contract with Messer Construction for the Courthouse Expansion Construction Manager at Risk Services. On December 13th, 2019, Messer Construction bid out the scope of work for the site enabling portion of the project. Uh, this will be referred to as GMP number one and is considered an extension to their original contract, which was for pre-construction services. GMP 1.5 was executed in August of 2020 and included the bid packages for the rammed aggregate piers, the below grade concrete and the tower crane. 
The GMP2 package, which represents the remainder of the bid packages for the new courthouse building, was executed at the end of December 2020. In May 2021, county staff requested $900,000 be transferred from the project contingency fund into the contract with Messer. Prior to that time, we were able to manage additional costs through a contract owner contingency that was created through buyout savings, also known as the difference between our phase budgets and the corresponding bid results. So basically, how much Messer got the subs to, to provide bids that were underneath our original budgeting. So those are called buyout savings. When the $900,000 that the board allowed to come into the GMP for contingency was moved into the contract, we had $168,000 remaining in the contract for owner's contingency for a total of $1,068,000. Since then, we've had significant bulletins and changes driven by a variety of different factors. Some of these are owner requests, others have been existing conditions, code review requirements, or further development of the documents. As we stand currently, these changes along with others currently pending will bring us to a balance of $214,327. In order to allow the, budget, the project to continue and quickly react to necessary changes, we are formally requesting the reallocation of an additional $1 million to our contract owner contingency to be spent at the approval of, okay, sorry, I got to be into the contract for owner contingency to be spent at the approval of Cabarrus County. It is worth noting that the total spent owner contingency to date, including buyout, is $1,084,589, which represents 1.57% of the total contracted cost of constructions of phase one. 1.5 and 2. In comparison, it's common for other construction projects at this scale, complexity and finish level to have an initial owner construction contingency to be 3%. The additional $1 million that, request, that we're requesting brings this project total owner contingency to 2.78% of the total contracted cost of construction. Okay, so that was the design team, Messer and myself, sitting down to create that narrative. So we sat down and crunched every number, every buyout savings, everything we had put in there, all the bulletins, all the changes by the DOT, all the changes by the City of Concord, Concord further developments and everything from insulation to spray proofing to everything that you could imagine going into that building to figure out what was driving this and also show what a project this scale or size should have in terms of contingency. After I wrote this, uh, Messer reached back out to me. They do a, a considerable amount for construction manager at risk at Mecklenburg County Schools. And they informed me that their, the contingency amount that the schools are carrying uh, for each school is 10%. That would have sounded better in the, in the agenda item, but it was already written. Um, but I also think that's because they're moving so quickly and the documents are not completely developed. So that's, that, that's not apples to apples in terms of our project. Um, we are carrying the funds. There is an actual contingency fund outside of the contract that the finance department maintains. And that's the same fund that eventually I will come in front of the board and ask if we want to do a chiller redundancy project, which is a project that I've already bought to you, to the board about con connecting the, the two large buildings across the street in terms of um, chilled water and, and HVAC connections. So that, that same account is there. If we put this money in there, they can't touch it without the approval of both the design team and the owner. Um, and it's not all spoken for in any way. It is just to continue the project. I can tell you that we've had a significant amount of stormwater and hardscape changes, not just in the building, but in the plaza. We've redesigned stormwater leaders throughout that building probably in excess of 15 to 20 times due to the different heights of the courtrooms and heights of the building. It's a very challenging site. So when you change one thing, you change a domino effect that imagine a stormwater drain from the roof that has to change its location because of the sprinkler heads in a, in a courtroom. The minute you change that, there's a hydraulic domino effect all the way down the line that affects every single place where that water has to go. So we spend a considerable amount of time when we make those changes, chasing down all the changes downstream on an engineering standpoint. So a lot of that has been derived from that. 
and there's also been some traffic impl implications. And I am prepared to, to talk about any of the issues. Okay, questions for Kyle? Kyle, I just have one question. On yes. the change order proposal, Yes. can you explain what the fee is? Yeah, so any anytime that you, you deal with a construction manager at risk, so I'm asking for one million to put in there, that is increasing the overall price of the, of the entire GMP. There are fees, there are builder's risk insurance, there's other things that goes along with that that the construction manager at risk has to has to assign those fees management fees everything so every value and, and that's a good question to understand how a gmp works when you get that bid from all those subcontractors those 42 subcontractors that are working across the street and that's all put in a package the fees that messer puts on top of that is what you would call the management fees to keep those 42 entities in the right direction there's also a good portion of that fee is for a CSIP, which, and just in terms of workers' comp and liability, um, Messer is, is, we negotiated with them early up. We wanted them to carry all of the workers' comp and issues that happen across the street. So every time a welding rod drops, you know, three stories and lands in somebody's back of their neck, I'm not running over there to take a report and we're not having to cover that. So that's one of those fees that's in there. Okay, thank you. Yes. Kyle, it might have been better to say someone strains their back like last week. Oh, uh, just just <laughs> just for, for complete transparency, that did not happen. That is just like a worst case scenario that keeps me up at night. Hey, if we, I mean, it seems to me if we're this far down the line and we're still not at three percent, then in the current climate, you're, it, yeah, you knock on wood that you just did. So if we're, we're to take it. To take action to get it to 2.7 and we're still under three, I would have, I mean, to me, five is probably more realistic when you look at the complexity of the building. So I'm, I'm, I'm good with, with what we're doing. And uh, um, I, you know, I'm, I appreciate the narrative to, to, to just reiterate how we got from, from, from point A to really point D by now. So we've, we've blown past B and C. So. Yeah, there's there's many a times that I've come up in front of the board with adding contingencies to certain things. So our our leadership here, we 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 build in contingency, but we usually keep it outside of the contracts, and then we kind of, I would almost say, ration it in as as things happen. I can tell you that as we move forward, uh, just going through different um, projected costs as we kind of work on our CIPs for future years, we're probably going to be carrying a much higher escalation rate. Um, versus trying to absorb that in the contingency. Yeah. Um, in fact, some of the folks that I talk to are trying to carry a 15% escalation rate right now. Yeah. Well, it's impacting a lot of a lot of projects and a lot of yes. a lot of people all over, not just here, yep. but it's everywhere. So, and and lead times are a, a struggle at the moment too. So that's why we have a lot of equipment sitting on the roof across yeah. the street. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's all part of the, when they earn that fee, they manage all of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, additional questions for Kyle. All right, and I think you have the next item, uh, Cabarrus County Emergency Medical Services Headquarters change orders. Uh, presenting a change order request to both GMP1 and GMP2 for the Emergency Medical Services Headquarters. Uh, GMP1 represents the civil portion of that project and the change order is being driven by a change in water utility sizes and road work. Uh, the change order to GMP2 results from a change in electrical conduit and sleeves resulting from the reconfiguring uh, the entrance at Union Cemetery. So obviously we haven't come vertical out of the ground at EMS headquarters. So little odd for me to be up here asking for a change order um, to the contract. It is a challenging site, um, geologically speaking. Uh, and I think that you're all very, very aware of that. Um, there's also uh, an added component to that, that the, the traffic, uh, not just at the intersection of Union Cemetery and Cabarrus, but also along Cabarrus, in terms of the amount of utilities that are in the ground right there, where our large, very large stormwater basin is, and all the rock on top of that, have made the reviews and the changes um, from both the DOT and the city, they, they've come in, um, as we were already getting started and resulted in a lot of these changes. Um, in terms of utility sizes, 
we didn't we didn't need a four inch we needed a three inch but the city doesn't provide a three inch so i have to pay for a four inch so uh, th and that's just as an example of a lot of these change orders of where they're coming from um, i really want to get vertical because the minute we get out of the ground i'll feel a lot more comfortable um, about change orders um, but this is this is what i see and i i think they're is something still pending from the DOT, but I feel confident that we can absorb it with the contingency we have in the project. However, I did not feel that, uh, that we could absorb this and anything else down the line with the current contingency. Questions on that item? Very good. We'll move to item 4.16, Frank List Barn Replacement Bid Award. Uh, the Franklis Park Barn Replacement Project was advertised on November 15th, 2021. Bids were received on December 15th, 2021 and 3 p.m. for the Franklis Park Barn Rebuild Project. Um, Going to kind of discuss what type of bids we got and, and also announce who the winner is. Um, the winner is, in fact, Ike's Construction. We had four bids and I kind of just wanted to give you a range on, on the bids. So between the number one and number two bidder, there was a $400,000 difference. And the range in between the number one bidder and the number four bidder, meaning the, the top and the, the lowest, or the highest and the lowest, was $800,000. So quite frankly, in today's uh, market, that's a, that's a pretty good tight range right there. Um, so the, the motion is, is to approve, to suspend the rules and approve the bid award and authorize the county manager to execute the contract between Cabarrus County and Ike's construction. That total value, the project total was $5,220,500. That does include the alternate of the silo. That is within the budget that we currently have. Without any contingency. There, there is, there is some, there is some owner's contingency in that. Uh, there's just not anything outside of the contract, but we do have the budget for this. And to kind of go back historically, the last time that I met with the board on this to go through uh, true cost of it, we were anticipating uh, through our DD phase of it was at five point three million dollars. So uh, I would like to just say to the county staff and the design team uh, that went through this. Uh, they dialed that in pretty pretty tight in a very difficult market where uh, there's a lot of wood in that building, and, and that that was a that was a challenge. Questions on this item? The reason that I'm looking to suspend the rules and and vote tonight is to provide a notice to proceed to allow the contractor Ike's Construction who won it to procure specifically start procuring the wood. Um, I do not anticipate that you will see significant construction happen on site until probably the middle of February, if not the beginning of March. We have acquired a, a sediment and erosion control uh, permit, but we still need an overall stormwater permit for the entire Frank Lisk, uh Park site. And the state is, has a, a lot on their plates right now, so we're kind of working with them to try to, to fast track that. What's the BAS system? Uh, building automation, so that's connecting all of your HVAC so that we can control it over the computers rather than having to go out there okay. and change right. it every time so we can diagnose the issues. Um, most of it would go, you see it happen in, um, in rooms like this where someone might be warm and they, they might ask somebody to turn a temperature down. That, that allows that person to turn that temperature down. Does that ever happen here? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I can recall. <laughs> uh, no, it's interesting that has you know the the silo lighting they all they they got basically the same number almost pretty close that system they're pretty far apart on but you know just the way that's the way it goes. Yep. Yeah, right. Mr. Chairman, I well sorry, I was going to make a motion that we suspend the rules. Absolutely. Do I hear a second? We have a motion and a second to suspend the rules. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. And we move then 
would entertain a motion to approve the bid award and authorize the county manager to execute the contract between Cabarrus County and Ike's Construction, subject to revision by the county attorney. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Yes, we are the current owners of the property, finally. Um, prior to this, under our lease, we had to ask permission for anything we did like this. So long ago, we had asked permission, <laughs> hoping we wouldn't need it, and I thought we were going to get to tonight with um, still needing that, but we are now the owners. Yes, and for, for those that may not be as familiar, he's talking about the transfer of the property that we previously leased from the state of North Carolina, which we now have been granted by the state of North Carolina, so we own the property. We do. We own all of Frank List Park as well as the soccer complex. Um, and we are working on the remainder of the property, um, doing the property division so they can then transfer those parcels to us. And as I had told you before, um, I've asked Mr. Cook to prepare those deeds and have passed that along to the state because he's a little faster than they are. Right. Well, uh, Jonathan has been very persistent throughout this entire project and, and leading that. So. Thank you very much for, for your efforts and congratulations on your success. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we move now to item 4.17, uh, library budget amendment, and Rodney Harris will lead us in that discussion. So as you know, each year we get a grant from the Ch Cannon Charitable Trust for our library system. This year, that grant is in the amount of $250,000. And so this budget amendment will appropriate that and it will be used for furniture at the Harrisburg Library, upgrading and adding new technology, uh, collection management software, and then funding to increase our digital collections, which obviously with the pandemic have gone up considerably. Great. Any questions on that item? Uh, we are extremely fortunate to have that level of support from the Canon Trust consistently uh, year after year so uh, for any of you that that may have uh, associations with some of the folks that serve on that board please please express our appreciation as as i certainly will okay then we move now to item 4.18 from planning and development budget amendment for construction standards and we're happy to have kelly sifford with us for that item and then the, and the next three after that, or four. I'll keep you maybe. busy for a little bit. Thank you. Uh, so the first item is the budget amendment for construction standards, and this is a request for um, some of our fund balance that we have created over the years uh, for technology um, and uh, three more vehicles. Uh, we lost count of our vehicles. We had several years ago when funds were tight, we had positions, but we didn't budget vehicles that year, and it finally caught up with us. Um, so we have uh, three more vehicles that we need to get everybody in a, a car um, in the next, uh, or a truck in the next uh, few months, depending on how long it takes to get those. Obviously, we've had some serious delays in acquiring those. And uh, we have been working, I've been working with Todd Shanley um, on uh, technology solutions for our contractors. Um, as you know, we've been working closely with that community for quite some time trying to get some solutions that they would like. We have found a texting software that they can text in inspections. And uh, we worked with them uh, and Todd pointed out some of their deficiencies in their program. And so they got with it and uh, improved all that security wise and all that. So um, we have uh, that that we're um, working through the process of getting a contract for. And so those are the two things that we're really looking for out of this budget amendment. Okay, questions for Kelly. Quick, Kelly, can you explain where the um, construction standards fund balance comes from? <laughs> so each year uh, for the past few years, we have over collected revenues. Um, obviously, we've been extremely busy. Um, that, uh, what was it, four or five years ago, the law changed. So every, uh, all the money that we generate as revenues in construction standards has to stay with that program. It can't be used to support other county activities. Um, so that's what we're tapping into for this request. It is not um, 
the general fund money. It is money generated from our revenues for which the contractors have paid fees. Any other questions? And we do once again have a request to take action on this item uh, tonight. So at this time, I would entertain a motion to suspend the rules. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Uh, and then would entertain a motion to adopt the budget amendment uh, as described for construction standards. So moved. Motion and a second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Thank you. And that will I allow us to order some trucks and see how long it takes for them to get here. <laughs> Good luck on that. Yeah. Uh, so the next item is a budget amendment with uh, Duke rebate funds. So as you know, each month we get uh, reimbursed by Duke for weatherization uh, projects that we do. Um, so this month we received $6,482. It is required to be placed back into the program. So we're simply asking that the revenues be placed into expense line items so that we can expend it. Okay. Any questions on that one? Okay. We we'll move on to 4.20. So this one is also a similar issue, $370 of consumer contributions that have been collected for the HHI program. Uh, when we provide service to the elderly, we are required to ask uh, if they would like to contribute to our program. Um, sometimes they do. Uh, so this is about six months worth of collections. Uh, so we are required again to put that back into the program to expand services. And what did you say that amount was? It's $370. $370. It's not okay. an astronomical amount. Right. <laughs> Just cleaning it up. Okay. Any questions on that one? Okay, we'll move to 4.21, Community Development Programs for 2020. Okay, so this one is, uh, okay, I rolled several items into one. Uh, you know, each year I come to ask you for permission to apply for the typical grants that we apply for, um, the weatherization, the heating and air, the ho housing and home improvement, um, and we've added the Blue Cross and the Duke if they offer those. Um, both of those have been um, no match. Um, so uh, the only one of those programs that is match is the housing and home improvement. It's 10% as part of that HCCBG block grant that is a larger uh, program that has a lot of services for aging and uh, DHS. And so that it's part of that. Um, so that we're asking for permission to apply for all of those in our typical cycle. Um, the other thing that has arisen is there is um, rescue money in the home program in, in particular. It's coming through the home consortium. Um, we believe it to be about $578,000. Um, typically we are required to pay match for home money, but they are not requiring match as we have been told for this particular funding. Um, it is however tied very closely to homelessness, which is something we, as you all know, kind of work more on the periphery. We don't usually um, get involved in, I guess, housing them. Um, so this uh, it would be a project that we would probably work with the nonprofit on. Um, and there are some specific requirements in, th in this program that we would need to work through um, in order to provide that. So I needed to be able to give Concord an answer that we were tentatively going to accept the money but I also would like the ability, I know it's not the t way I typically do for you, but I would also like the ability to turn it down if we find that we cannot use it effectively. Um, I don't want to get stuck with $578,000 and not spend it, um, you know, when it could be used somewhere else. Um, so that's kind of what I'm asking for with the particular, in the particular the home money is the ability to move forward with it if we find a good project that we can work with, if not, be able to turn that down. And it, we would have to come back to you with a contract um, anyway, and that it looks to be late spring before a contract would come through for that money. Well, there, there are several nonprofits that, there are, that appear to be 
Yes, this one had just, it has a lot of ties. Um, right. It's specifically tied to housing. It has some supportive service elements. Um, I just have started getting information, and as you all know, the rules keep changing <laughs> on these programs. Um, so, I, you know, I want to investigate it because it's a great opportunity to get something big done if we if we can find the right project that everything works for. All right. Next. Questions on that one? Okay. Then we move to item 4.22, new to ITS position for support of Excella program. And I, Todd has come up to join me on this one. So. Um, we are proposing a new position uh, to support the Acela program. Um, we do have Derek Lytle and, um, who works on the program. Uh, all 20, he's, he's dedicated to that program. Matt Saunders, who you saw was spending a lot of time <laughs> dealing with payroll issues, is also in support of this program, but not fully. Um, we have found, uh, since we have brought the cities really fully on board, that they have really started using the program more and they're requesting more tweaks to the system, um, which probably 85 to 90% of all of the uses of the program result in a permit. So um, it's the, fun, the, funds, the funds are being collected through us. But what we would like to do is to, as we've asked them to come join us and do this one-stop shop, to be able to really provide the technological service that we want to provide. And so Derek has a, set, a certain set of skills. He's awesome with being able to take what we uh, non-techies tell him what we want, and he knows how to get it done. Um, what he does need is some help with somebody who can do the programming and help us manage some of these apps, like the texting app that we were just talking about. Um, so this, again, would be paid for out of our funds, the, the funds that we've generated with the rev collected revenues in the previous years. Um, we would like to use some of that down, and then, you know, we, can, uh, we will at some point obviously have to adjust our funds in the future, but right now, you know, we're fine where we are, um, but this is a half a year proposal for funding because we don't typically ask for the full year. We just ask for the whatever part, and, but we would like to be able to go ahead and get this out there because obviously it's going to take Todd some time to find the perfect person to do this, and he's been great lately at choosing <coughs> staff to, to work with us, and so we would really like to be able to get this position out there in the advertising so we can move forward. Is there anything to add? Uh, yeah, Derek is a business analyst on our team, and what we're looking at is a systems administrator, so somebody on the, the, to balance off that technical piece, and we model that in a couple other departments. Uh, we work with uh, Wendy and HR, Wendy in finance and, and Lundy in HR on the uh, on the Muni side in that same model with uh, business analysts and, and uh, systems admins working together to help uh, bring these technologies to bear. So sometimes tech people don't speak business language as well. So rather than trying to teach this tech person so much, we bring these two people together to, to, to solve these solutions and, and do it well. So. I think that's the gap that we found, and, and Kelly's right. The uh, the amount of work that that is coming is is just overwhelming. Quite frankly, Matt Saunders, who who leads that team right now, and he's filling that gap. So this is also an application that we do not host. We host it here uh, on prem, which uh, we will probably, based on my previous uh, presentation, we will continue to do for some years, uh, and that takes some some expertise to be able to keep that system online. And that would be a great help to have that that system to have been to do that. And to be clear, the, the the growth in the request from the cities has been ongoing. Another piece of this is the failing forward program that we've been participating in. As we've been going through and and starting to whittle down, we realized we don't put the resources toward this that we need to put in order to provide the service level we really want to provide. And so that came became clear pretty quickly in this process. On the, um, the personnel and you adjusted position request, yes, is that amount a half a year? It's, well, it's probably more like a third of a year. Uh, I, I, so Suzanne, who was here earlier, actually did this part of it for me. Okay. Um, but this position, you know, it's not going to have a vehicle. We're talking about a salary and equipment and licensing. Um, you know, it's it's not. Uh, it it will probably be end up being. I would guess around. I think I adjusted. It's yeah, it's around uh, 102,000 a year for. So that was a year, but I thought you figured out. 
Yes, the, the, I, I don't know if you actually got this. There was a portion that w we worked on that was we're required to submit. You may not have um, that we're required to submit when we do our budget that explains the position and everything that goes along with it. And so I had run that in order to figure out what all we needed to request. So I just wanted to make sure I was with you. Yeah, sorry. So the 100 is not a third of the year. Okay. Yes, that's the hundred. It's the full year. If that, if that was, if that was, yeah, that was kind of where seeing. I was going. No, she okay. was seeing forty-eight. Oh, so, okay. yeah. I mean, I was just trying to understand. She so. knew that was low. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's now, that's the half year. Yeah. This this technology has has progressed over the years and become more complicated. And now, as as Kelly said, we're bringing in more partners, and they're wanting to use it more. Yeah. Uh, so now it is truly a one stop one stop shop. So if you turn in your plans at, at a city or a town. It's immediately into the system. We can all access it. The contractors, the, everybody can access this all along the way. So and, that's a real plus. And, and one, of, you know, one of the major questions is we, when we sit down with these prospective businesses and these contractors, is how fast can you review my plans? How fast can I start construction? And how far, how fast can I get products moving down the line? And so this is a, a long. Not only does it help us internally, but it helps us provide a better product out there as well. And with the, add, the addition of the e-permit hub that we did, what, two years ago now, um, we're saving contractors money. They're submitting electronic plans so they don't have to come here. They don't have to get a bunch of plans printed. Um, you know, that has saved uh, enormous amounts of time for everybody. Um, so we, these are, um, pr these different technologies are helping us and, and we didn't really want to spread out and do multiple technologies, but that's the kind of the model that Acela uses. And so we've found that the, these um, enhancement softwares are very useful. And the collaboration between the municipalities is, is really um, significant at this point. Uh, th just this year, we rolled out uh, code enforcement for Kannapolis without any external help or anything. Usually that has to go to a, a third party to, to bring them online. And then with their new uh, planning director there, he reached out to us and, and said, hey, we really want to get you know, this online rather than doing it the old way. So. Um, I think that was a huge success that we, we can build on. Yes. Well, I want to make a motion to suspend the rules due to the same concerns. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to suspend the rules. Any discussion? I'll just say that uh, yeah, I certainly applaud what, what you're doing, and I think Commissioner Honeycutt and I have had 30 contractors in this room it's probably been six years ago <laughs> now but the very clear message that we heard from them was the the level of service is what is important to us not the amount of the fee yeah you know, we as long as that we get the service that we want it sounds like this is taking us further along to that place so thank you for all all your work in that that area. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. And I would at this time entertain a motion to approve the position request and the associated budget amendment for the proposed position. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Thank you so much. Thank you. We appreciate it. And we move now to item 4.23 <laughs> from Planning and Development, Susie Morris, to talk about some text amendments. Thank yes. you for your patience, <laughs> being the very last on the agenda. Yes. Good evening. Um, what you have before you this evening is a follow-up. <laughs> if you remember a few months ago, we talked about the floodplain ordinance and our community rating system and some changes that needed to be made. Um, ISO, FEMA, and the state have finally agreed on what those changes are. So what we are uh, presenting is a model ordinance that has been revised to include those particular changes that are needed, not only for CRS communities in North Carolina, but also for NFIP communities, which is anybody that participates in just the general flood insurance program. Um, so there are some changes um, related to elevating buildings, mechanical, and how that happens, uh, which was the sticking point the last time. And then they also have included what's called a digital map repository. 
So here in North Carolina, we're a coordinating technical partner. Uh, the state is with FEMA. So that Frizz system that you've heard us talk about a couple of times maybe, or maybe some of you have used it. Um, I know we did some training for real estate uh, professionals one time. Um, so that program now will be the official map repository in North Carolina. So we may have the paper maps in the office, but as they are changed, those changes are added into that system much more quickly than our mapping updates happen, which are typically eight to 10 years. So that will be the official repository. They added that in. Other than that, there was one minor change to clarify that if you were storing vehicles in the floodplain or near the floodplain, that you had to meet commercial design standards. Uh, the same thing that you would, you know, for a house. You have to be at the BFE plus two to avoid those vehicles from being flooded. Um, so then there are two additional minor changes that are typos. One is that we need a correction to a date in chapter one. And then the second is that we have a chapter reference that needs to be changed in chapter five. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have, and there will need to be a public hearing scheduled for this particular item. Okay, <clears throat> questions for Susie. All right, thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Okay, we move now to the approval of our regular meeting agenda. And you all have a copy of that before you. I do not think we've taken any action tonight that would change anything there unless somebody else has caught something. Uh, so at this time, I would entertain a motion to approve the regular meeting agenda as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. Um, I'm sorry to report that we do not have need of a closed session tonight. I know that that will disappoint everyone. Uh, but at this time, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. And we stand adjourned, and we thank all of those in our viewing audience that have joined us tonight.